Okay, sorry about the delayed start, but we're really pushing the boundaries and trying lots of live stuff, and it's always a bit of a pain when you have to do a last minute setup. So, I seem to have a bit of a, um, a reputation for taking technology into places it really shouldn't go. And I, I don't know why that is, it just seems to be like that. So, a little while ago, I acquired myself one of these, and my wife thought that I was buying a car. But we all know the reality. It's not... And about the time I got the car, Flame and I were talking about car modifications and hacking hardware and things like that. He has a 300ZX, and we were talking about various things that we could do to them. And um, what you're going to see in this talk are basically a couple of different approaches that we've taken. We've both been modifying our cars, and um, mine's relatively recent. It's about a six-year-old design. Um, Flame's car is a little bit older, so the technology level is quite different. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So how do you get started? Well, basically, with a, a really modern car, once you strip away the skin, I mean, everybody knows that modern cars have got computers in them. The general concept is a car has a computer in it, and when you take it along to a mechanic, you know, they plug in a laptop and they tweak some settings and then they charge you $2,000. And that's what everybody thinks it is. In the RX-8, the primary uh, computer in the car, they call the PCM, or the powertrain control module. The generic term is ECU, or electronic control module. Some, in the older cars, it was engine control module because there was only ever one of them. But in a modern car, there is not just one ECU. In the case of an RX-8, there's the powertrain control module. There's also the anti-lock braking system. Oh, and also, I should point out, the powertrain control module is not some dinky little microcontroller. It's actually a 32-bit machine. It's quite grunty. There's the anti-lock braking system, which is rather important. <clears throat> the instrumentation cluster. In an RX-8, this has actually got two CPUs just to run the dashboard. There's the keyless entry control module, uh, the um, electronic power steering system, once again, rather critical. There's a dynamic stability control. So this is another ECU which has um, accelerometers and things in it, measures your, measures um, slippage of the tires, and it can do things like, as you are cornering, if you are understeering, which means that you're trying to turn into the corner but the car is drifting off um, out of the corner, it can partially apply the brakes to the back right wheel to pivot the car around the centre of gravity or around the restriction. And it basically it can control understeer and oversteer dynamically as you're driving along. So with dynamic stability control, a car can be pushed a lot harder than it can without it. There is also a steering angle sensor. This is um, attached to the end of the shaft coming down from the steering wheel. And it has, also has two torque sensors attached to it. So the car is getting continuous feedback on how much pressure you're applying, not just the position of the steering, but whether you're applying pressure and how much it is. And there's also the tyre pressure monitoring system. So it's actively checking the status of the tyre pressure and all the tyres, making sure everything is working OK. And if my car was an auto, it's not, it's a manual, but if it was an auto, there would also be a transmission control module. Now, this is really just the start of it. We're looking at a lot of computers right here. And an RX-8 is a relatively conservative car in design terms by today's standards. A lot of modern cars have, uh, like, in the order of 40 computers in them. And this is from the factory. This is before you even start playing with it. So there's an awful lot of technology in a modern car. And to the typical person, it can seem totally inaccessible. But I was really curious. I wanted to see what could be done. So I wanted to start investigating what, uh, what the technology is based on, how it all works, and um, start playing with it. But there's a little diagram here. Don't care about the detail. There's one point I want to make here. This is one little segment of the 55 pages of the wiring diagram of an RX-8. And that's not counting all the ECUs. That's just the wiring between them is 55 pages. The, the issue here is that that box you can see on the left-hand side is part of the, um, the Bose in-car entertainment system. If you look carefully, there is a little link here that says, to anti-lock brake system. <laughs> that's where things get interesting. A modern car is a very complex system with a whole lot of interrelated components that are talking very rapidly. And obviously you need real-time communication between them. So when you start messing around with it, you have to be very careful of the unexpected side effects of some of the things that you do. 
So the thing is, where do you start? How do you actually... A, a car, for all intents and purposes, if you just walk up to it, is a sealed box. It's like having a computer with the, the cover welded on and you can't play around with it. How do you get into it and actually start looking at how it works? If you're looking at a reasonably modern car, the first thing you need to be aware of is OBD, which is Onboard Diagnostics. This has been around in a couple of iterations for quite a while now. Since about 96, every car, I think it was 96, every car sold in California was required by law to have an OBD interface on it. That means that basically any legislation that's passed in California automatically applies everywhere else because the car manufacturers want to sell their cars in California. So any reasonably recent car will have an OBD port on it of some vintage. There was a, some early OBD1. The most common one that you see on pretty much any car nowadays is OBD2, which has been around for quite a while. That is the port that your mechanic will use when they plug in their laptop and they want to talk to the car and find out what it's doing. Because there are all these computers on it, but there needs to be some way to, um, to communicate with them. OBD is a single interface that lets you connect through into the internal communication system of the car. And because it's a, legislat it's a standard, basically all cars operate the same in terms of the interface. In the early days, a lot of onboard electronics was custom, and um, so you would need a different connection for every type of car. Each manufacturer would have their own. But nowadays, with a standard OBD interface, you can be reasonably assured of being able to plug into pretty much any car and get some sensible communication happening. You may not get the full capabilities of that particular model, but you'll get some basic stuff. And it, it's actually pretty simple. This thing is an OBD dongle. And you can buy them off eBay for you know, in the order of $40. It's, this particular one is very similar to the one I have. It has a USB connection in it. And you basically just plug it into the socket under the dash, plug the other end into your laptop running Linux. It enumerates itself as a serial port and you can open a direct serial connection into the, uh, the onboard systems on your car. So that's really, really cool. You can get some really interesting information out of it that way. So if you're just curious and you want to investigate, it doesn't really cost all that much. Basically a serial console, $40 dongle, and you can start seeing some real-time data coming back from your car. Once you actually get into the car itself, how do all of these devices communicate? Essentially, we're talking about something equivalent to an office LAN. There are a bunch of computers that are talking to each other all the time. The way that's done in most modern cars is using a technology called controller area network. And um, once again, this is something that's been around for a little while, and it's taken a while for all manufacturers to switch over to it. Um, Subaru, for example, I think has only switched to it in the last model year or thereabouts. Some manufacturers have been using it for years. And it's a really interesting little communications protocol. Uh, it's more than a protocol, it's the, um, it defines the physical access layers and all of that sort of stuff as well. The issues that you deal with communicating between devices in a car are fairly critical compared to dealing with you know, just sending email across a LAN. If you get packet collisions on TCP IP, no worries, you just retry. What happens though if you get a packet collision because your car is trying to deploy the airbags while you are changing the volume on the radio. That's not good. You don't want those sorts of collisions to occur. So I won't go into this in great detail, but this is just a, an example of some of the, the clever solutions that have been found to these sorts of problems. This is an example of um, sending some data on um, the CAN. Now, those of you who are purists and understand how CAN actually works know that this is not a 100% accurate representation. This is just a representation of the concept, so don't yell at me, please. But imagine that we have two controllers. One is a higher priority than the other. So we've got controller one, controller two, and then they're both trying to send a signal out on the bus. What they do is they start by sending a bit, basically a start bit, saying, I'm going to start talking now. So imagine they were both trying to do this at the same time. So at the exact same moment, two controllers start sending a bit. On the bus itself, it goes high, so we get a logical high, and there's a bit. That's fine and then they both send a logical high again. Once again, the bus sees it and it's fine. But the way it works is that the higher priority um, controller always needs to get its message through no matter what happens. So at this point, we get to the identifying bit, and this is sent least significant bit first. We get to the identifying bit where these two controllers have a difference of priority. The interesting, the really clever thing about this is that instead of sending absolute values of high and low, they send a value of high and don't care. 
So when they are sending a zero value, they do not assert the bus. And then while they're not asserting the bus, they listen to see if anybody else is asserting the bus. And if they do, they know that someone has just outranked them and they'd better stop talking. So in this particular case, the signal on the bus is a signal that's being sent by controller one, the higher priority one, and then it might send a, a low bit and then it sends a high bit. But by this time, controller two realises, hey, I better shut up now, I'm stepping on someone else's toes. And so controller one's message gets through. The cool thing about this is controller one never even saw the collision. There was no retry. The message got through as if no one else had been doing anything else on the bus. So high priority messages always get through. So this is just an example of some of the really clever stuff that's done inside um, vehicle electronics to make sure that you get real-time response. Now, people that have been working with real-time systems are probably quite familiar with this. But for people coming from a, a software world who just assume that the network gets your stuff from here to there and they don't really care about it, this can sometimes seem a little bit like black magic. But it's very cool, and it works. So I started playing with my Mazda, opened the boot, and I discovered this little alcove in the bottom, which just was begging for something to be put in it. So I started by making up a little frame, which fitted in there just nicely, and then fitted it out. Now, I ran into some problems. There are a couple of fails here. One is that I was using regular sealed lead acid batteries, which are across the top there, which do not like being deep cycled. They go, uh, I'm dying now. And anyone that went to um, Thomas Rinkmeyer's talk about remote system management a couple of days ago, everything that he said, double plus good. Basically, he had some, uh, some very good information there about batteries and making them survive and keeping systems running in remote areas. The issues that he's faced basically are the same things that I've come up against and I've made mistakes that he was probably clever enough to avoid in the first place. I also have a little charger circuit in there so that the batteries are always being topped up from the accessory power. And there is a USB hub, which actually is no longer in there, as you'll see in a second, which is connected to a bunch of things. And I started out with a Net4801, which is a Socrus board. Some of you might be familiar with them. They are often used as um, wireless access points and routers and things like that. It's a very low power board. And I should point out that part of my objective with all of this, there are two different approaches. The traditional approach to putting a computer in a car is you put in something big and powerful and you start it up when the ignition starts and then you have a circuit that allows it to shut down gracefully when you turn off the ignition. I didn't want that. I want my car online 24-7. <laughs> if I'm not near it, I want to be able to pull up a web interface and say, hi, where are you? <laughs> so my, the big problem that I've had to face through all of this is power management trying to get power usage down to the point where I can keep this stuff running all the time. So this is what's currently in the boot. The, um, the Net4801 has been replaced by an Alex 1, which is basically like a, um, a slight, a next generation version. It's a slightly newer board, 500 megahertz geode processor. It's basically a full, it's a full x86 machine. I'm running Ubuntu on it. And it pulls four watts, like total. That's it, the entire computer in four watts. So it's a very cool little device. And I've also replaced the battery with a 28 amp hour deep cycle seal lead acid battery. Other than that, stuff is very much similar. And you can see down in the bottom left corner there is a massive USB connection. There's a whole heap of stuff and there's an audio stuff. So I've got connections to a whole bunch of different things in there. Um, Wi-Fi, so that the car itself can um, be an access point. So that if you're nearby with something like a, um, an internet tablet. I didn't pull it out earlier. I'm not sure where it is now, but if you have something like a, a Nokia you know, N810 internet tablet, oh, there's one being held up right there. <laughs> that could basically be a remote control for your car, as long as you're within Wi-Fi range of it and you associate with it. With a little web interface and Apache running on it, you can do all sorts of fun things. Um, 3G, which <laughs> doesn't work down here, um, because I'm with 3, and that's really painful. But um, normally the car is online using um, 3, and I'm running a dynamic DNS client so that at any point in time I can go to rx8.oxford.com.au and there's my car. OBD, so onboard diagnostics connection. There's a GPS, so I've got a little USB mouse GPS sitting up on the parcel shelf. And um, I have a connection to an ignition controller which is running an Arduino and is wired into all sorts of um, sensitive places in the car's electrical system. 
And there's also an RFID connection. There is an RFID reader attached to the back right window of the car. And the idea is, well, maybe we can talk about that in a moment. And audio. So I've got an audio connection into it. Through the OBD um, system, there are a whole bunch of different things. This is just some examples. There are, there is lots more information you can get out of it. But what I have is a little routine which connects to the OBD interface, connects to GPS, and sticks all these bits of information into a MySQL database. So the idea is that all the time the car is logging everything about what's happening. And that means that you can build up a history of what the car has done. That means you can do things like draw pretty graphs like this. So this is a view of a trip around the block. And the grey line across the top is intake air temperature. The car had been idling for a while, so it was pretty hot. Road speed is the blue one down the bottom, and throttle position. So you can see, I was sitting in the driveway, blipped the throttle while it was out of gear, didn't move. Blipped it again in reverse, and you can see the speed went up three or four kilometres an hour as I backed out of the driveway. And then as I accelerated up the street, you can see the speed rise, and then because there was airflow coming in through the radiator, the intake air temperature fell. So this is over the space of a couple of minutes, basically a, a drive out and around the block and around some streets. So you can, yes. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do actually live um, one block back from a fairly major road, so you can do reasonable speeds down that, but let's move on. <laughs> let's just not correlate that to the GPS data. So. This is um, something I did to hack audio into it. I wanted to be able to send audio from the computer in the back through into the existing car sound system. So I started by ripping it out, which is a really, really hard job in a modern car, and everything is integrated, like the climate control is all part of the same assembly. So I pulled it out and um, had to do a little bit of trickery because there's no auxiliary input on this particular head unit. So what I did was wire some inputs in basically after the preamp that comes from the CD player. Then I used a little bit of a Perl script to generate myself a 60-minute WAV file of silence and burnt myself a silent audio CD. So what you do is you chuck the audio CD in and hit play, and it plays, silence. And then you just send the, send the signal in right behind its back, and it, it comes through. It works really well. <laughs> it doesn't know the difference. Now, reversing cameras. Actually, I might see if I can pull up a little animation for this. Someone forgot to tell me that reversing cameras are only meant to be attached to a car. I was thinking it'd be much more useful if you could get a video feed from outside the car. Imagine if you could get a third-person perspective view. Because the thing is that when you're in your car, wouldn't it be handy if you could step out of your car and walk down, the, sort of walk around and just go, hmm, yes, you're doing really well. Yeah, you've got a little bit further to go. So what I did was um, set up a system. When my car is parked in the driveway, it's logged into the, car's, uh, into the house's Wi-Fi network, which has cameras. And so what I've done, I can show people. I didn't have time to repair it, unfortunately. But I can, what you can do is send a, a signal through streaming into the car of a live video feed from multiple security cameras. So you can see a third-person view. So you can basically be driving, looking at the screen, and seeing yourself from outside the car as you're driving out of the driveway. <laughs> World of War car. <laughs> so in my particular case, I have one camera mounted high on the house looking down on the driveway, so it's like a God's eye view. And I have another camera mounted um, just next to my front gate that some of you will have seen pictures of previously, looking down the street um, across the front of my driveway. So I can see if someone is walking down the footpath even while I'm in the driveway itself, which is kind of cool. So... Where do we go with this? Um, let me just see if I can get a connection. We were having trouble getting a connection to the car earlier, but I may be able to now. Oh, hey, I am in the car. Okay, it's just very laggy. Cool. So, oh, I forgot. It's not running the right keyboard layout. Lag. Yeah, everybody get off the network, please. <laughs> <laughs> Lag from steering wheel equals valid, yes. 
Ah, which reminds me, I'll tell you a little story while I'm trying to get this working. All these nasty ideas come into my head when I see data being fed from one system to another. For example, I was looking at um, self-parking cars a little while ago. You know, you line it up and you press a button and it figures out where you go. They look really spooky because, you know, the steering wheel just spins by itself and it does its thing. And then I was thinking, it's got electrically assisted power steering. It's got a torque sensor on the steering wheel. If I can tell the power steering system that I'm applying pressure to the steering wheel, it'll help me. I haven't actually tried it yet, but I'm very, very tempted. Your car is not your exoskeleton. <laughs> no. Uh, and something else, I should, I should make this comment. It seems that just about every talk I do starts with a warning saying, this can kill you. <laughs> it's become a bit of a tradition. The thing is that when you're doing this stuff, it won't just kill you. You can kill other people as well. So you have to even beat out. <laughs> so you have to be really, really careful. So let's just have a quick look at this. No. I haven't actually messed with any of the existing systems other than ignition and security and a couple of things like that. Yeah, nothing important. The bit that makes it go. I don't think we're going to really get anywhere with this because I'm still waiting for this line to finish. We might try this again at the end if we've got time. In the meantime, I think it's time to hand over to Flame and um, he can tell you a little bit about some of the stuff he's been doing with his car. Okay. Uh, I took a, a very different approach to John uh, with this project in that I first of all looked into the price of uh, existing computer equipment that I could put in the car. And there's some really nifty little devices that you can buy from overseas, and they are exceptionally expensive. Uh, one of the ones I looked into was in the order of uh, 1,000 euro, and this is a three and a half inch screen. Running Linux though. So I thought, can I make a sub $100 car PC? So my first attempt was shopping online. So I, of course, hit up eBay. Now, on eBay, I did manage to find some machines with touchscreen uh, that would run Linux. However, I ran into problems like this, where we have serial port support 100%, frame buffer 100 or 20%, depending on which model you have, and all the way down the bottom, sound 0%. So that's not going to play my MP3s for me. So we have a fail. Next, I tried shopping in the real world. Cash converters, of course. We want something cheap. So I went along to cash converters on a Sunday morning. Unfortunately, the retail shop was closed today. I did, however, find another cash converter that was open. And I managed to find a triple EPC, second hand at retail price. <laughs> and this lovely router, which is OpenWRT compatible, for all of $3 less than what I can buy it for brand new, or rather, the latest version of it brand new. I tried the computer markets, but then I decided I don't really want to install pirated software and movies in my car, <laughs> so we have another fail. My next uh, option was to look around the house and see what have I got that I might be able to put in the car. And what I found was either too small, too big, <laughs> too difficult. Really, really, I need that for work. <laughs> now, this one was interesting, and I pondered this one for a while. However, this actually belongs to Dex and I value my life. Likewise, I value my life. You can actually run Linux on these things, but they don't have a touch screen, and they don't have a keyboard, and they don't have any uh, graphical interface on them, so there's not a lot you can really do with it. It wasn't worth risking my life over. This one has a touch screen. Once again, I value my life. 
Okay, by this stage, I was getting desperate. It was obviously time for something different. That was a fail. And it was time to go dumpster diving. <laughs> Metaphorically, of course. A couple of posts to the right mailing lists, and all of a sudden I had laptops. Uh, what have we got there? Two laptops, two webcams, uh, two network cards, USB to serial cable, which I'd previously bought one of for $25, uh, an amp and a USB hub. Uh, another crappy old computer. A not so crappy old computer, but fairly old. That's a P100 and a triple EPC. Now this triple EPC, this particular one, had a faulty power supply. I'm putting it in the car, I don't care. And a faulty keyboard. I wasn't planning on keeping that anyway. So I quickly disassembled it. And everything else. There was carnage. <laughs> However, the machines actually work afterwards, and I can prove it. Both of them, they're fired up. Okay, so the first thing I actually modified in the car was to install the amp, which required pat uh, power run directly from the battery through the firewall. And that's half of the panels missing out of the inside of my car, and the amp just sitting in the back. Uh, wired it all in, and that's, uh, you can see it at the sort of bottom and middle of the picture there. It actually sits under the passenger seat through the triple, EC, uh, triple EPC in the back of the car and went for a drive with music coming from the computer and it was all working fine. So, it was time to mount the, uh, the triple EPC and I went for a little, uh, a little bit unconventional place to mount it. Uh, the 300ZX is a two-seater and there's a space in between the two seats. There's normally a cover there, not the nasty little metal thing. And I decided I was going to mount it there. That's the panel that came out. That's the cat being interested in the computer uh, project. So, in behind this panel, there was some um, soundproofing, which I removed, and in its place put the triple EPC, or the innards from the triple EPC, and they fit in there. And the screen was going to fit nicely on the front of it. The only problem was that little circuit board, which instead of being small, uh, instead of being something that sort of sits under the screen or behind the screen or in the, with the rest of the notebook, it sits up the side and along the bottom. And what that means is, if we go back to the previous slide, there's no room for that circuit board. So what I had to do was actually extend the cables on the, uh, the screen for the triple EPC. And I found a cable uh, from one of the other notebooks that was donated uh, which I could use to extend the backlight. And that's the actual little L-shaped circuit board wrapped in, uh, in uh, electrical tape. And I've just had to twist the, um, the little ribbon cable coming out of the battery and put it around 90 degrees to make it fit. I got some rubber from Clark Rubber and uh, cut it up with a Stanley knife to make uh, rubber edging for the screen so we didn't have the uh, nasty sharp uh, metal edges. Drilled some holes in the, uh, in the panel and uh, cut a hole with a Dremel. If, uh, if you want to start modifying your car, the, uh, the best tool you can ever buy is a Dremel. Okay, so I took the casing for the triple EPC, cut off those little bits on the end that we didn't need. The same on the bottom, I pulled the circuit board out, cut some little bits of plastic away that we didn't need anymore, put it all back together. Uh, removed the keys from the mouse buttons so that they didn't accidentally get pressed and cut a little hole which the video cable, which is that uh, sort of black cable coming out of the top right of it, could come through. I had to solder, and I hate soldering, I had to solder two wires onto the power button so that I could actually remotely power on the device because unfortunately the triple EPCs don't have a BIOS that allows you to um, set them to start on power. And with some bits of foam and some cables, I managed to jam it all in place in behind that panel. When I got out to the car, 
and uh, started trying to fit it all in, one of the things I discovered was that there wasn't enough clearance in the bottom to, um, to get the USB cables uh, out of the machine, and I really needed them to um, plug in memory sticks and keyboards and such. So once again, I took out the Dremel, and I actually had to cut apart the heads of the USB cables and bend them to almost, uh, almost 90 degrees. Okay, uh, that's where I used to have a cigarette lighter adapter in my car. Uh, which of course is attached to accessory power and I've simply cut that cable and uh, hooked the power up into the back of the car where the uh, computer power supplies go. Bought some power supplies, dismantled the, uh, the cigarette lighter adapters so that I could just wire them straight in and that's the finished result. And that's a total cost of less than $100 for that whole project. The most expensive single item there was the power supply which was $35. So we have a success. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you've ever tried to look at a screen that's between your seats <laughs> while you're driving, it's very difficult. It's also very difficult to control the volume on, uh, on your CD, on your MP3 player when you have absolutely no way of input, uh, other than, of course, hooking the USB keyboard up on your knee while you're driving, looking back at the screen. It, it's, it's, not a good, it's not a real good idea. So, so why would I do that? There is one... <laughs> there is one thought that I had. <laughs> the one thought I had... The reversing cameras that you see on, on a lot of modern cars now, they have a screen in your dashboard that you can look at while you're reversing. So basically, you're heading that way, you're looking that way. You might get a good view of, of a little bit from the camera, but there's a lot that you're not seeing. So eventually, the idea is going to be that when I look over my shoulder to reverse, I'm actually going to be able to glance down and see an image from the reversing camera on my screen there. But it's not a lot of use for, uh, for anything else in the car. But of course, I had other plans for the dashboard, which started with disassembling, uh, removing the plastic around there, pulling out all of the audio gear in the car, putting the CD player back again, because obviously I forgot to uh, eject my CD before pulling it out. <laughs> now, the space on my dashboard is not big enough to even fit uh, an 11-inch screen. So, obviously, there was only one answer. Put in a 15-inch screen. <laughs> I had one lying around. So, I started with some bits of cardboard and made myself a, uh, an alpha version. This is the guts out of the laptop sitting on top, which has just, uh, just had some rubber edging run around the, uh, the, uh, the sides of it because anything that you want to mount on your dashboard in a car, you have to think about what's going to happen in a crash. Okay, so you don't want sharp edges there. And that's where the screen's going to sit. Looks pretty good to me. So, another trip down to Clark Rubber, and I had the, uh, the very helpful staff uh, cut the pieces out for me. I'm glad I wasn't doing it myself, because it's a hell of a job. And this would be the beta version of the hardware. So, I pulled the laptop uh, even further apart, took the Dremel once again, uh, actually attached that rubber edging with silicon sealant, and that's what the finished product looks like on top. And underneath, you can see sort of in the middle of there, there's the, um, the little metal brackets that I've used to actually mount it to that foam. So, uh, I actually did manage to find something useful on eBay, which was a $99.15 inch touch panel, which fitted onto the screen with some double-sided tape, and uh, once again, rubber edging around it. And, of course, metal brackets in the back to mount it in place and some electrical tape to hold everything together. 
This is a motherboard out of yet another laptop that was donated to me. The smaller circuit board is actually the board with the power switch from the laptop that I used uh, in the car. And it had a little tiny plug on it, uh, which is very similar to a plug which was on the other laptop. I took to that with a Dremel and cut the plug off, which allowed me to solder wires into the back of it so that I could actually toggle the power on the, uh, on the motherboard in the front of my car. Those, uh, those wires end up in a panel which sits under the steering column and a couple of little buttons. So I now have two buttons, one to start each of the machines. I have a collection of power supplies which all sit behind the passenger seat. There's quite a lot of room back there. And that's the finished computer uh, sitting in my lounge room. And that's what it looks like from on top. That's what the dashboard looked like with all the cables hanging out uh, just before I installed it. But before we did that, I wanted to install a network in the car. So the, the, just behind the, uh, the passenger seat on the, uh, on the left there, you can see some blue network cables. So that's where my cables were all running to. In the bottom right, on the right-hand side of the, uh, the ridiculous space saver tire that's in there, there's, there's a little uh, styrofoam block which has got a, uh, a jack uh, in it, which looks something like that, with all of the panels removed from the back of my car. So I pulled that out, carved a hole in it, installed a network point, and popped it back in the car. So I now have uh, two network points in the back of my car in case I ever want to, to expand it or maybe I was at a conference and we couldn't get the Wi-Fi working and I ran a big long network cable out to the car and plugged it into that port. <laughs> very, very useful. So, ran the cables uh, to a switch, which you can see the top of there. Um, that's maybe a better view of it. That's an even better view of it. So, that is an Asus WL520GU, which is an OpenWRT compliant, uh, compatible router, which is going to give me Wi-Fi one day. Actually, it was giving me Wi-Fi while I was running around in the car for about a week with a completely open network. connected to the machine which uh, was connected to my ECU. So that's the, uh, where the network point terminates at the front of the car. And this is what the, uh, what the computer looks like installed in the car. And of course running Ubuntu. No, that, that kind of thing doesn't worry me. The machine has a fan. You can see it there. <laughs> and of course, the most important modification, which uh, I'm sure you can see in those photos, uh, this photo, there's a lot of extra wiring in the car. So it now has two fire extinguishers. I should just jump in here and say that I actually smoked a car once. <laughs> Maybe not in the way you're thinking, but it wasn't in a good way. <laughs> um, it was, many, many years ago, I had an RX3 that had a... It had been gutted, basically. The entire wiring loom was custom-built. And um, driving down the road one day, smoke started coming out from under the dash, and I had to leap out and actually use the fire extinguisher. So <laughs> it's just an illustration of the fact that you've got to be careful with this stuff. There was a question. Yes, you. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Better hurry up then. Okay. So, moving right along. Um, software, LCA, and stuff. So, came along to LCA. No? I'm going to start with software. Okay. This is the design of, uh, of the touchscreen display in my dashboard. Uh, it shows up the top speed with a speed graph, uh, engine temperature, a map, uh, down the bottom, there's uh, MP3 controls down the bottom, and there's volume control down the side. So that's the design of it, and that's what it actually looks like right now. <laughs> that is actually an Ajax web application, which is running on the front-end computer connecting to the back-end computer 
uh, via a network protocol. When you say five minutes, five minutes before we're over? Oops. Okay, we had some bugs uh, that we discovered on the way down. Most of them across the number plate. <laughs> but we did some bug fixing. <laughs> there's, there's really no way to explain this. Other, other, than, other than to say... <laughs> other than to say that there is a camera in his hand and this is the result. So if anyone's actually driven up to the top of Mount Wellington, that tower there, that's really annoying. <laughs> because the skyline in the front of the picture, he's actually doing the emergency procedure to bypass his um, anti-theft system, which would not turn off because of the radio interference from that tower. So while we were at LCA, uh, we did some configuration on the, um, on the machine in the front, and I got some help with that. Actually, that reminds me. I have remote start on my car, but it's not remote start the way you would normally expect. Uh, it uses a neural network. You there, Hamish? <laughs> Are you there, Hamish? Yes, I'm here. Could I get you to start my car? Sure, not a problem. Thank you. Do you want to put it out over the um, over the live feed? Sorry, what was that? Do you want to put it out over the live feed? The guys are sort of sitting around here a bit. Sort of... No, we don't have live feed on this side. Sorry, what was that? I cut you off there. There's no live feed. <laughs> we have no live feed. Okay, we also had um, some help hacking uh, webcams to work in the car. Quite a lot of help hacking webcams to work in the car. While this was going on, I was hard at work with John on the robotic bear. We also had some help from the guys in the NOC, uh, Steve in particular, in getting OpenWRT installed onto uh, the router in my car. Okay, so listening to the engine in my car, uh, what I found was some existing ECU software, which was open source, and seeing as we're out of time, I'm going to skip through that. It runs on the car, it uh, gives us a bunch of details, and if we're lucky, can I switch to a yep. camshaft? Oh, maybe I'll see. I do. It's written on my hand. Ooh. Actually, um, ah. well, I, I think this needs to be responding just while I'm here. We'll see if I can outdo Flames Remote Start. Hello. So let's give it a try. We'll. No, I'm leaving it locked out there. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> let's just see if we can get some values back. So this is from the engine management system. So it's currently running at 985 RPM. 955, so it's idling. And for a little while, I um, actually had that network socket open to the internet direct to my ECU. <laughs> and then I told um, Crash the host name of my car. And about five minutes later, I fired up IP tables and fixed the problem. <laughs> if you'd known the right port, you wouldn't have even needed a username and password.
Thanks. Can I get you to jump in my car and rev the engine? That's what I'm doing. actually says, why I really want a PC in the car, not in the c <laughs> And that should be obvious. <laughs> the next project, of course, is car-to-car -car Minesweeper Protocol. <laughs> so, what's next? I have big plans for my car, one of which includes removing the uh, three-litre petrol twin-turbo engine and replacing it with an electric uh, motor or a pair of electric motors. And I want to beat the zero to 100 time from a stock twin-turbo in doing that. Unfortunately, that is going to cost a lot of money. We do. And uh, I would be quite happy to make my car look something like this for an appropriate sponsor. <laughs> so, anyone in the audience? That happens to manufacture laptops, perhaps? Uh, I and batteries? I'm looking for B-Dale, but I can't find him. <laughs> Thank you, I think that's all. And also, the cars are going to be at open day tomorrow, and you'll be able to look at them, and we'll dem do live demos, and you can play around with them a little bit as well. So, thank you very much. Well, it's still on. Anyway, I think they deserve another full round of applause and I'll present them their speaker gifts. <laughs>